How's it going, Sean? Welcome to the Good. panel. Appreciate you coming on. I recently just found out about you. I um recently just switched my view from not believing in the pre-existence to the pre-existence of Christ. And I've seen a debate on your channel. So that's how I've found out about you. All right. Which, If you could say which book you thought tipped you over the edge, what do you think it was? Which book of scripture? I, I, think, I think John makes the best case for pre-existence. And then you see other verses here or there, but I would say the book of John the most. Yeah. And then outside sources like Enoch, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Sec Second Temple Judaism, like different different things. All right. Yeah, I, it's funny that people get so wrapped up in, in the descriptions of the son himself, um, whether he preexisted, whether he was eternal, all that kind of stuff. And, and they kind of ignore what he's actually doing right now. And that's, that's what we try to shed some light on. I think maybe those are some of the questions you had for me anyway. So look forward to getting into it with you, brother. Yeah. 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 We'll get into that. So, um, so, so what are you, I guess, an Aryan, would that be your Christology? I guess, you know, I don't, I don't know. Every Not to put a label on it. Yeah. I don't know everything he taught. So I would, I, I don't really, people going to call me whatever they want. You know, um, I just know that I'm not, um, I'm a scriptural. I, I try to keep the scriptures in context, look up the definitions of words, try to keep it simple. Um, and try to, instead of assigning myself to some, you know, clubhouse of specific, uh, you know, doctrine of men, you know what I'm saying? So like, um, I don't know all the intricacies of all the arguments between the classic Trinitarians and the Arians at the council of Nicaea. I just know that it was a heated debate and clearly the majority won. Um, but I don't ascribe to Trinitarianism anyway. Um, right. So I, I, I don't I'm, not, I'm not really a Unitarian because to my understanding, there's quite a, a wide range of Unitarians and some of them don't believe in the preexistence of Christ. I do believe in the preexistence of Christ. And so I don't really try to identify with that group either, but I got, I got all love for all the groups anyway. So I just view them as brothers in Christ. We're all trying to do this walk and figure it out. Right. So, so would you say that Jesus always existed or was there like a point in time? I say the scriptures don't tell us. Uh, I say okay. uh, it doesn't tell us one way or another. I would say that logically, um, if he's calling his father greater than he is and that his father is the almighty, there's only one person in scripture called the almighty. And if the almighty is the source of all creation, then at some point, even though the scriptures don't tell us when, but at some point before the earth and the heavens were created, uh, the son came forth from the father in some fashion. What does that look like? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us, or at least the scriptures we have still today don't tell us. So we'll just ask when we get there. Right. Yeah. Th that's how I view it. Also, if Jesus is the son, it seems like the son can't be as old as the father. I'm not saying an yeah. age, but I mean, I, I really do believe that Jesus is the son of God, like the way my son's my actual son. You know, so, I had debates with Trinitarians, classical Trinitarians. I asked them that same question. I say, so why are we using these terms father and son if they both have always existed equally in power and in ontology um, and, and length of life? If they're both eternal, why are you calling one the father? Why are you calling one the son? And they they would tell me, well, we're just we're giving it that that label, those names, because it's things that humans can relate to. Um, and I'm sitting there saying that's that doesn't make sense. That's not how we use words. That's not the definitions of words. That's not how Yeshua used the definition of his father. Um, he spoke about his father as the one true ruler of heaven and earth, the almighty. That's that's what that word God means in John 17, three through five. Um, and so you may have seen some of the debates I've done where I try to actually help Trinitarians define some of the terms they're using, like the word God itself, because they'll use it out of its context or they'll use it semantically in a variety of different uses without defining it. And that's where they get into a whole bunch of muddy waters that contradict itself. So I just try to define our terms. Yeah, they can use God whenever it's convenient. The, the Trinitarians can refer to whatever they want at any given point in time. And then the speaker can be whoever they want to make it at that point in time out of the, the three, which, yeah, it seems illogical. But, yeah, I, d I definitely think that, that Jesus is an actual son. I think that's what, what the Bible is saying. So there has to be some – he has to come from his father, I would think, lo logically. Yeah, I mean, if the father's, again, I can't stress it enough. Um, 
consistently throughout the scriptures, there's only one person that's called the Almighty. And that's it's just simple. You don't have to overcomplicate it beyond that. Like there's an Almighty, he has a son, he gave his son all authority in heaven and earth. So we're obviously going to respect his son and love his son and worship his son. Um, so in addition to the word God, I try to remind folks to define the word worship as well, because there's two uses of the word worship in scripture. There's one that's a temple service, which is priests in an ordained temple performing a creating a meal and a sacrifice for the Almighty. And then there is obedience, or I should say obedience, which is bowing down in respect. And this is what every knee will do to Yeshua because he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords under the authority of his father. So that's the storyline that was uh, prophesied about the Messiah, was that he would become uh, the hope to which all the Gentiles would put their hope in. He would be the, the, the ruler of all the nations. And um, this is why I love Paul exegeting this concept and with greater explanation of 1 Corinthians 15, he goes in to directly tell us that even though all things were subjected to the Son, except the Father himself, he tells us directly in 1 Corinthians 15, 27 and 28. And that's a verse that I'd, I've never been able to get a Trinitarian to actually talk with me directly about that verse. And so it's, it's um, yeah, it's a very simple process. There's a there's an Almighty. He he decided he wanted his son to be ruler over heaven and earth. It still doesn't mean that the Almighty is subjected to the Son or that the Son has the same authority as the Almighty. It just means that um, he chose. It's like a emperor choosing a king. Yeah. Well, um, what is it? Revelation one eight. They always say Jesus is calling himself Almighty in that verse. How how do you deal with with that verse? I always try to remind folks to read for context. So you want to read the whole chapter. And if you read Revelation chapter one, verse one, the very opening statement, it tells you that the message that John is receiving originates from the father, from the almighty given to the testimony of Jesus. Jesus is the testimony, meaning he affirms the message. So he's the second person in this chain of custody of this message getting down to John. Then there's a third character in Revelation 1.1. It's the angel that is giving the message from Jesus to John. So it goes from God the Father to Jesus to the angel to John. So that's why in Revelation you have to be careful because there are different places about who's speaking in different times. So I know a lot of preachers will try to tell you the entire book of Revelation is just Jesus speaking, but that's... Absolutely not true. Clearly, John asks questions at different times. The angel responds to John and, and talks to him in specific ways at certain times. Um, and then Yeshua talks at some times, and then the Almighty talks at other times, because ultimately the message itself is from the Almighty. So it's a, it, we just have to read for context is what I would encourage folks. And um, just remember that that original message, uh, even though a lot of modern translators will like to put a lot of the words in red, that's their personal decision. That was not in the original Greek. And so that confuses a lot of modern day Christians because they think, oh, all the all the words that are in the red are Christ's words. So then they see the stuff like that and they think, oh, that must mean that there's a Trinitary concept. That must, you know, and the oneness people love this. They'll say, see, look, he is the almighty. And you're like, actually, that's just a translator who decided to, to paint those words red because of their predisposition. But if we look in the original Greek, didn't have any any coloring. <laughs> there's, it was all in the capitals. There's no punctuation. There's no chapter breaks. There's no verses. Um, so you have to discern who's speaking through context of the of reading comprehension. And that's where I just always point people back to the very first verse in Revelation. It tells you who the message came from. It came from the Almighty. Right. The revelation that God gave yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And if you follow that in context, the, the one that's Almighty is the one sitting on the throne. And then the Lamb walks yep. up to him and, and grabs the scroll if, if you read it all, all the way through. Yeah, in chapter 5, the Lamb is the only one worthy to come up to the Almighty on the throne and get that scroll for judgment. So, okay, you have a view I, I've never heard anyone talk about, and, and I haven't looked into it that much. I, I had just seen it from, I guess, Kelly Powers doing a take on, on you. On a video I watched the other day. Oh, and okay. It, so, you, so you saw it from a person that has... Yeah, yes, yes. That doesn't yes. like me and likes to slander me. I got you. Right. Okay. So, right. And it was on... Um, so Jesus is doing sacrifices in, in heaven? That is what Hebrews tells us. Okay. That's what Psalm 110 tells us. That's what, that's what the whole prophesied point of the Messiah is. is. That he would become a priest who ministers 
in the tabernacle in heaven. So, so right now, Jesus is, I guess, the, the high screen. priest in heaven, and he's he's giving sacrifices for our our sins. He's over the angelic priesthood that already ministered in the tabernacle in heaven. He's now their authority, as Hebrews one explains, and he is. Uh, he will do the sacrifices that are appropriate for the high priest to do according to the law of God. It so, doesn't mean he's doing every single sacrifice every single day, but they're, but he's doing the ones that are appropriate to his position according to God's law for a right. priest in the temple. So what, what was the, the point of the cross? I guess from a Protestant view or, to his priesthood, right? That's where uh, he makes but, atonement for us and then has the authority to resurrect us later. That was what was prophesied of him in, in Isaiah 53 is that the servant of the Lord would be able to bear the sins of the, of the people and justify the many. That's the role of a priest in the law of God. So so him going to the cross, I guess, gave him the authority to be the heavenly high priest to do... The cross, the cross is what got him to his resurrection. Like he, um, That was the unfortunate means to an end. That was the, the result of him coming to a wicked and corrupt generation that was going to betray and kill prophet of god which they did all the prophets before him so this is the point of him the cross specifically if if the cross did everything that was prophesied of him there's no point of him being resurrected and ascending to heaven and being made a priest in the temple in heaven just think about it for a minute so that that i know that preachers since you and i've been alive every preacher in every church corner in, in our modern culture they focus on the cross and they stop right there they don't tell the rest of the story the rest of the story, which was actually prophesied in the Old Testament, is that Jesus, the Son of God, would become a servant, a minister to Yahweh in the heavenly tabernacle in the order of Melchizedek. It's a priesthood. And that was the purpose of why he was sent. That's how, according to God's law, he's justified to make atonement for our sins and then is able to resurrect us on the day of the Lord. What, what type of animals are these though like in heaven i guess whatever type like spiritual? Uh, whatever type same type that he comes back on in a horse in revelation 19 there's there's animals in heaven yeah yeah i'm just asking i've never heard this view, you before so i'm not like yeah. going at your no, i get it no, I'm, I'm just, I, i've just I'm never heard be, this before so i'm just asking no you're great brother i'm not trying to be tongue-in-cheek i'm serious like people don't think about these things because they don't take the bible seriously i'm not saying you don't but the average person doesn't take the bible seriously so when they read Jesus comes back on a horse, they think what? They think he came down to the earth first, grabbed a horse, and then caused it to fly, then went back up to heaven so he could come back down? No, he came, becomes back on a horse. That means he has a horse that he comes in on. There's animals in heaven, just like Jeremiah tells us. In the kingdom of God, the rams of Nabioth will shout and leap for joy. There's animals. There's, If you read uh, Jeremiah 38, um, I think it's uh, 38 verse 1 through seven, one through 10 in the Septuagint. Um, it talks about land, crops, wine, wine. That means you've got grapes. Um, it talks about the, the kingdom of God having an entire ecosystem. So this is another, it, it blends into another topic that the average modern church is, has adopted a Catholic Gnostic mindset. But, and I would strongly put forth that the Trinity doctrine is very Gnostic as well, but we can get in, that's a different show. But as far as the mindset of people not realizing that heaven is a real and tangible place, they think it's a, a wispy ghost town where, where clouds are abundant and there's no solid ground or sky or earth or ecology or animals or no, it's a real place. It's, I mean, it's, it's literally, that's how, um, that's how we have the wedding supper of the lamb after the resurrection and we're in the kingdom of God and he serves us slaughtered oxen and fattened calves in Matthew 22. What, what, when we die, do do we go to the kingdom or or do we soul sleep, I, I guess? Well, it depends on how you're defining that. That soul sleep, from what I heard, is a, is a comes from a an ancient concept that doesn't really accurately define what the Bible says. But I'll, I'll try to give you a quick summary of what I understand the Bible to say as far as when you die, you go to a place called Sheol, which is a place of rest. But it's not sleep as in the sense of you and I going to sleep every night and being unconscious. So this is where the English translated language confuses people because they the word rest from the Hebrew gets translated as sleep into the English and it confuses people. Um, but when you die, your soul goes to a place of preservation. You're either being preserved in the unrighteous side of Sheol 
awaiting judgment to be thrown in the lake of fire, or you're being preserved to be resurrected to eternal life. Those are the two the two places for the, the human soul goes after the death of the physical body. This is why at the resurrection, we have to get a new body, right? And where our soul goes into a new incorruptible body with God's law written on our new hearts so that we never transgress again. So in Acts 24, Paul has been arrested by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they're having him on trial before the high priest. And he claims, I'm on trial because I believe in the resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. Because they're both, this is the Old Testament theology about what happens when you die. They're both being held in a place of preservation. And this is the same place described in Luke 16's parable by Yeshua, the master teacher, who's not going to be teaching us false afterlife theology. It's not just a parable that's up for interpretation. He's teaching us accurate afterlife theology of what happens because Yeshua didn't teach doctrines of accommodation. He taught accurate information. And he tells directly in Luke 16, the rich man who was unrighteous, he went to the unrighteous side of Sheol, Lazarus, who was righteous, went to what's what was culturally called Abraham's bosom, which is the righteous side. And uh, there's a great chasm between the two. And they know their lots once they get there. They know they're either waiting judgment to, to eternal condemnation and destruction in the lake of fire, or they're awaiting resurrection to eternal life. So this is what uh, all, you know, the, if you've never read the books of Baruch, of the Old Testament it used to be in our Bible in America was taken out about 120 years ago. Um, it, it talks about this emphatically as well. Um, Psalm 49, 7 through 15 talks about this. They all understood the concept. Um, even Psalm 16, 10, the one that's quoted by Peter in Acts 2, where he's explaining Yeshua did not decay, you know, in, in that same way the psalmist says in Psalm 16, but I know my Redeemer will redeem my soul from Sheol. That is, that is the, the eternal destination. Now, this is a validated, um, excuse me, I shouldn't say it like that. That is the long, the long, um, the long standing destination of the soul of man until they get resurrected. So Hebrews 11, 39 and 40 confirms this in a, in a much New Testament passage, talking about all the people that Hebrews 11 just mentioned, what's generically called in a lot of churches, the Hall of Faith chapter mentions all these uh, these wonderful patriarchs, men and women that um, did great things and testified of their faith amongst persecution. And he says, all of them will be perfected together with us. So this is a, this is, you have to read 11, chapter 11, verse 39 and 40, uh, because it's talking about the great day of the Lord, the resurrection of the saints, which is called the first resurrection event that happens on the seventh trumpet at the return of Christ. So this is a, an important points in the eschatology um, and the understanding of the covenant. Um, so you the, don't go the, straight to heaven when you die. That's a Catholic concept. Right. The the, the only thing I, I don't make sense out of this whole Sheol thing or, or waiting for judgment, wouldn't you already know where you're going to end up based on what side you're on? Yeah, that's what I just said. That's why even right. in the parable, Yeshua says the, the rich man who ended up in the unrighteous side, he was sad. Well, and, and well, well to, that's my point. What 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 would the point of the judgment be at, after that to get out of Sheol to face like a great white throne judgment if you're just going to be thrown right back into where you not, were at? You're not thrown right back. You're thrown into like a fire at the judgment and your your body and soul are distinct extinguished from existence. Right. This is what uh Math, Matthew 10 28 Yeshua says, do not fear men who can just kill the body, but fear God who can kill both the body and the soul. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. You, But there would be Gehenna. no point in going to the judgment because you would already know where you're going to end up. You know what I mean? There's, there's no, This is one of God's judgments and decrees that, you know, um, I don't, I just trust that he knows what's best. Um, I, he has an appointed time for the judgment of the unrighteous. And um, he has an appointed time for the two different resurrections of the righteous. The first resurrection event that happens at his second coming at the beginning of the millennial reign, then the second resurrection of the righteous at the end of the millennial reign. Um, so he has an appointed time for the storyline, and that, that's his judgment. I just have to trust he knows what's best in that regard. I agree with you. I mean, I understand what you're asking. Like, if they know that they're doomed to the lake of fire, just go ahead and throw them in there. Why wait? But, like, he, he's got a purpose for his judgment. Right. Now, um... Do you, I guess you keep the Torah? I guess you keep the that. Torah. Be correct. Did you know that? I'm sorry. What? You keep the Torah. Did you know that? 
Um, no, I, I don't. You don't kidnap people. You don't murder people. You don't cheat on your wife. You don't lie. You obey your parents the best you can. You you don't worship other gods. Yeah, I mean, I, I I I live righteously. I don't, I don't follow all the um, like that's Israel. I'm just laws. trying. To, I'm just trying I, to joke with you, brother. I'm just yeah, yeah. I, just I got you. Yeah, trying to encourage you just to say, hey, just Torah is just a word. It just right. means instructions. It's not this, but don't don't fall for the don't fall for the semantics of Judaism, right? Judaism tries to make Torah to be out some special thing, right? It's just a word. It means God's instructions for behavior. So you and I both follow his instructions for behavior, according to the example of our Messiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ taught the, his father's commandments. That's what we practice. As you grow in your discipleship, you're going to start practicing more and more of those commandments as you understand the wisdom of those commandments better and better and can ingrain them into your life more and more. That's why we practice and we are being sanctified. Present tense, we're being sanctified as we walk out in holiness, the commandments of the Lord. Um, so. I just got to a point after, you know, 15, 16 years of my walk of Christ uh, around the year 2014, I got to a point of realizing, oh, wait a minute. Um, these other commandments, they're called eternal. And um, I realized because I did some studying that Judaism was claiming those those commandments were just for Judaism, but they're actually not. They're like for everyone who believes in Yahweh and his son, you get grafted into the vine of Israel. And so that means all the instructions for covenant Israel applies to me. So there's a false dichotomy I had to research between the early Christians and the and the, the rabbis of the first and second century AD, where they created this stark divide because they hated Christians so much. And they didn't want Christians following the feasts and the Sabbath because they were like, no, those are ours. You can't keep those. And so unfortunately, uneducated Christians at that time acquiesced to that type of intimidation. But that's not what the Bible says, man. The Bible says the Sabbath is eternal. God's law, all of God's laws and decrees and judgments are eternal. Now you just have to apply them according to your life, according to the context of your life. So like, you don't, you don't take the, the verses in the old Testament that talk about a woman, um, things that apply to a woman. You would not, obviously you wouldn't follow those because you're a man, right? Uh, you would, the, to the ones that apply to a, like a, a mother, like in Proverbs 31, you, that don't apply to you. You're a man. The, the ones that apply to men apply to you. Right. So you just have to read all the all the instructions and just apply them to your life as best that you can and just let the Holy Spirit guide you. Um, I know that it was a unique thing, just like Paul says in first for in Romans chapter six, where he talks about how the law of God revealed sin. And he says, I didn't know what coveting was until I read in the law about coveting. Right. Until the law. Right. In the same way, brother, I didn't know the Sabbath. I didn't understand the benefit, the blessing of the Sabbath until I read about it in the law. I was never, quote unquote, convicted by the Holy Spirit to keep the Sabbath because I was always taught the moment I became a Christian in 1997. Oh, the Sabbath is for the Jews. You're a Christian. You don't have to do that. But then when I actually read the book for myself, I was like, wait a minute. God keeps this. It's not not these this particular ethnic group of Jewish people. God himself keeps this day. He said it's eternally set apart and hallowed as a special set apart day for rest. And then my Messiah says that the Sabbath was made for mankind. So why would I think that they can claim it? And like, it's a blessing to me. I get to, I work my butt off six days a week, but I get to take a, a set aside day with no guilt. I get to take off work and just enjoy my family, rest with the Lord, learn the scriptures it's a wonderful time. It's an eternal thing. So then I started studying eschatology and I started realizing like, you know, prophecies of, in Isaiah and Jeremiah, Micah. They think, I was like, wait a minute. It says that everyone's going to have to, all the nations are going to keep the Sabbath in Isaiah 66. They're all going to be keeping the Sabbath and coming to the New Jerusalem, the, the city of Zion. Um, and Isaiah 2, 2 through 5, it says that uh, that Zion will be made the chief of the mountains in the last days, and all the nations will stream to it to learn the law of the Lord. That well, means they're going to keep Sabbath and everything and everything and contextually applies to them and the law of the Lord. They're going to learn it so they can keep it. This is how there's peace on the earth for a thousand years. I, I'm not I'm not objective to um, keeping the Sabbath. I think we, we should. But what do you do? Like. Say like you couldn't. Like, hey, like man, say every, for like almost three years. So yeah, the, yeah, like, point, like, point like say every doctor took off on Saturday, or every like firefighter or guy that works on yeah. the power line. Like, how would our society actually 
Now, remember may, may Yeshua's change. words. Yeshua said it's not unlawful to do good on the Sabbath. If you're saving someone's life through your profession, and you, you know, I would, we always encourage folks that are in those types of professions, look, ask for that day off. But if they got to have you on call, just remember the actual work that you're doing on that day is literally to save somebody's life. It's not just for profit, right? Because uh, the whole point of the Sabbath is that you just stop working for profit. You just chill for one day, you know, and you just trust in the Lord, right? As opposed to overworking yourself, thinking that you've got to go get that money. Otherwise, you're not secure. So you give one day of the week to the Lord to trust in his security. But it's not unlawful to, as Yeshua explains, to do good on the Sabbath. And so, um, I, you know, when I first came to the awareness of taking that one day off a week and um, I was working at a job where I was a, like a sales manager over multiple stores and I, I didn't have the option to take off Saturday. Saturday was our huge sales day. That's how I made my money. So how am I going to do this? And I prayed for two and a half years, like, Father, please give me favor with the company so I can get a better schedule or help my clients come in during the week instead of just on the weekend so I can make my money early and get off on Saturday or help me get a new job. He, he helped me get a new job. And then I was able to faithfully keep the Sabbath. And my life has just been increasingly blessed every year since then. And the, the Sabbath is Saturday, right? Correct. Yeah. You yeah, would say, Saturday. right. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's been a blessing. Yeah, that's awesome. What, what's your view on, um, I guess, in times? Um, like, is is there this future kingdom coming like where christ reigns for a thousand years yeah yeah i'm definitely not a you know there's all these these fancy uh names they give them like amillennial postmillennial um preterism things like that people give to the idea that they think that we're going to actively be creating the kingdom of god and peace on the earth over time some people think it already came and went like no bro the ver the, the the prophecies about the coming kingdom are super clear once he shows up Daniel 7, Isaiah 42, uh, like there's so many prophecies, Matthew 25. Once he shows up, it's forever. He's never going away again. The Father and the Son and their house are coming down through the sky to sit between the Euphrates and the Nile. Revelation 21, it's not metaphoric. It's not, I mean, no normal reading comprehension should tell you that that's an interpretive passage. It's giving literal physical dimensions with, with physical measurements. It's telling you the construction of the city. It's telling you how people interact with it. It's telling you that the nations will bring their wealth to it in homage. So it's a physical paradise of God. The tabernacle, actually, by the way, is what it's called in Revelation 21. That's a temple where men, priests minister inside of it, right? The tabernacle comes and descends to the earth. This is prophesied back in the book of Ezra, from the prophet Ezra from the 6th century BC. This is prophesied in Isaiah. Um, this is all over the place, man. It's it's it is what Hebrews eleven tells us Abraham looked for. He looked for a, a city whose architect and builder was God, a heavenly country, as verse fourteen says in Hebrews eleven. So this is a we believe in a physical, literal kingdom of God because we believe the Bible's description of biblical cosmology that we don't live on some heliocentric model and a ball floating randomly in space, going at at crazy speeds in a vacuum of nothingness. We believe in a biblical description of creation, as the Bible tells us, which is an enclosed firmament structure. And we're at the bottom layer of that firmament structure. And so flat, that's flat, that'd be flat earth, right? Um, when you, when you Google, terms. yeah, when you Google that term, uh, you get stupid stuff. You get stupid pictures, right? You get like a, a piece of land with water floating off of it in space on top of a turtle. That's not what the Bible describes. That's mockery. What the Bible describes is an actual structure that has multiple layers, seven, seven layers, and then two basements. Um, and then we live on that bottom layer with six layers above us. And it's all a perfectly designed large structure. So this is why we always point people back to Genesis one verse, verse 68, when it talks about the firmament that was made on day two, that was the last firmament that was made. There was other, the other six firmaments were made on day one in Genesis one, one, there's other verses that expound on that through other prophets, but, the Genesis um, Genesis one six through eight passage where it talks about day two of creation, the second firmament that encloses where mankind lives, that one is the last firmament that was made, the seventh firmament, and that was the name given to that was called the Shomayim, which is the Hebrew 
is the word heaven. So it's like imagine, imagine is that why Paul built, references like seventh heaven. Uh, yeah, Paul references a third heaven in Second Corinthians twelve. Um, and Deuteronomy 10, 14, Moses talks about Yahweh is the most high in the heaven of heavens, meaning the top layer of heavens. Uh, some of the psalmists reference the most high is that, uh, that same way. But imagine like if you built a house and you built like a, I'd say like this, say like you built a seven story apartment building and you, you know, you used wood nails, you know, screws and, and metal beams and all that stuff. And then when you done finish with your project and you step back and look at it, you don't tell people, hey, look at my collection of nails and screws and wood beams. You say, hey, look at my apartment building. So in the same way, after the firmament layers were finished and completed, that's why Genesis 1.8 says the, the name given to the firmament was the heaven. So the, the structure that we're encapsulated in then, that's above us and around us is called the heaven. This is biblical cosmology. So this makes perfect sense when you get to the end of the book and you see the firmaments being rolled back like a scroll and the new Jerusalem is coming down to where we live. This is the promise of the covenant in Ezekiel 36 and 37, where the house of Yahweh, the tabernacle of Yahweh, it comes and sojourns amongst men. It comes to tabernacle with men to live amongst mankind on the earth. It's a beautiful promise, bro. Our creator is going to come live with us on the ground here. We don't we don't exist forever in heaven. That's what Yeshua says in Matthew 5, the meek inherit the earth. We don't we don't inherit heaven. Would would, would you say Christ is reigning now? Christ is reigning over the church now, over the ecclesia. But the appointed time for him to reign over the nations and teach them how to to live according to God's law that has not come yet. That happens at the second coming. We're Right, because because they're still wicked today. Is, is that what you're well, saying? Because yeah, right, Christ isn't reigning over the fentanyl. Satan, addict, is, the Satan is actively called the god of this world right now. <clears throat> right, but but I'm you do able. believe Christ has all power and authority right now. He's just not reigning over. Um, I guess people haven't submitted their lives to Christ. Yeah, I mean, but think about like uh, there's a reason for the what's called the fearsome and dreaded day of the Lord like in Zeph Zephaniah talks about the second coming. Um, it's not, it's not a situation where um, like people just magically all get converted. I shouldn't say magically, but even through the Holy spirit going out and giving, dropping people the gift of faith in their hearts and, and lead them to repentance. Unfortunately, there's thousands of verses that, that tell a very different story. Like there will be a remnant of believers, but they will undergo persecution there's tons and tons of verses that talk about that leading to an incredible singular day where the, the heavens rolled open like a scroll and Yeshua returns with a bunch of warrior angels to fight the dragon, his two cohorts, the first and second beast, and all the kings of the earth that have aligned with them to fight Yeshua at his coming. Like it's a, it's a massive day. Um, and after he subjugates those people, all the remaining people from all the nations will come to the new Jerusalem for free medicine and water and food and provision. And there is where we have the Matthew 25 sheep and goats judgment. So that's when he's going to determine who has a heart to live around his kingdom and repopulate the earth throughout the millennial reign, or who's going to be a God hater and not want to go and not want to live in peace. And those will be deemed goats and they'll be, they'll be killed. This is the great day of judgment that all the prophets talked about. So does, uh, <clears throat> oh, sorry, Satan has access still to, I guess, heaven right now. I mean, if we, if we take seriously the book of Job, he can, he can go present himself to the father. If he wants, where he's the accuser of the brethren, he goes before the father accusing us. Um, I don't know. Yeah. He's definitely considered the accuser of the brethren. Um, but as far as like, Again, remember the, the description of where we live in relationship to heaven. Um, the sky above us, between the firmament that encloses us and the land where we live, that's called a type of heaven. That's referred to in context as a heaven because it's the sky where the birds fly. It's Genesis 120 calls it the open firmament. But then if you go above our firmament into the other layers of heaven, that's when you get up to the, the most highest throne at the top layer, the seventh layer. 
And that's where the angels will present themselves three times a year to the Father because that's that's his law in Exodus 23. This is why in Job 1 and 2, the angels are presenting themselves to the Father. And Satan came with them on, on, on this occasion. It's right. a requirement. All the, the, so basically what I'm trying to say is the, the law of God that all the prophets and that Yeshua taught as discipleship, um, the psalmists as well as, uh, you know, I would say Yeshua, but the psalmists directly tell us that that law is, is Yahweh's behavior. So this is this, that's, that's what all of heaven, all the angels in heaven, they abide by his law. Otherwise it would be chaos and destruction. So the only way there's peace in heaven is that his servants, his ministering angels all abide by his law, his way of life. And that way of life was told to mankind to practice. And that way of life includes working six days a week and taking one day off, bringing in the first fruits of your crops, treating people with love, treating people with forbearance and forgiveness, standing up for what's right. So his ministering angels, this is why Hebrews 1.14 refers to the angels as ministering servants that are sent out to help mankind that's inheriting salvation. Um, they abide by the Father's law. That's how they're considered holy, set-apart beings. And so all of heaven above us abides in perfect peace because they follow the law of the Creator on how to live. It's only down here where we got it. We, we constantly mess it up and we got chaos everywhere. Yeah. Um, I know you, you've done a lot with the, the book of Enoch, correct? Yeah. I, I've read it um, a couple times. So you hold to the, I guess, the Genesis 6, the, the angels come down and, and mated with, with women and produce the, the, the Nephilim. Yeah, that is the historical... Um, textual and definitional understanding of that passage. It was only until the third or fourth century AD until certain Catholic philosophers decided that they, they wanted to uh, reinterpret that passage. But historically, um, it, well, I shouldn't say that. There is a second century testimony by a guy named Tertullian, whom he claims some of the rabbis of Judaism didn't want to believe that angels could do that because they didn't believe in angels. Do you, do you remember in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 24 also, um, where he talks about the Sadducees, they don't believe in the angels or they don't believe in the resurrection? Yeah, they don't believe in life after death. Yeah, so there was a, or that not just that, but they don't believe in angels. So like th there was a sect of, of ancient disagreements that they did not like any passage that referenced an angel. They didn't believe in those. They didn't want right. to believe in them. <laughs> so to me, it's like, you got a testimony of all the prophets, both in Jude. Um, you got a book of Enoch is, is quoted by Jude, obviously, but um, Genesis itself, the book of Jubilees, which is an ancient uh, Israelite literature, the book of Second Esdras, um, which was written by the high priest Ezra. Um, you, you just got a, a wealth of testimony about, um, I mean, Second Peter 2, 4, the, the apostle Peter talks about the angels that send um, and are sent to Tartarus. Um, and so that's, you know, there's there's a wealth of ancient Hebrew testimony that they believe that story was very literal. Yeah, I I, I believe in that too. I believe in the yeah. the Genesis six account. I I think the Book of Enoch does make sense of some things we don't know. Like it mentions where demons come from, that they're the fallen spirits of the the Nephilim, like these That's disembodied right. spirit. How do you deal with the errors that are in Enoch, though? Like in some of the so, book, doesn't it reference like Enoch as the the Messiah, basically? No, that that's there. You're gonna find lot. You're gonna find people that don't like the Book of Enoch and that will claim there's errors in it, but actually haven't read it, or they've read that passage alone and they haven't read the rest of the book. So this is why we named our channel Kingdom in Context. We're always trying to get people to remember to read the full story. So in Enoch seventy one. He's been, if, you, if you are not familiar with the concept of the resurrection, you're going to be confused about the language, about why it's calling Enoch the son of man that's meant for righteousness. That's the promise of the covenant, brother. Is This is the same covenant give that, that Moses repeats in Leviticus 18, 4 and 5. If you do the statutes, commandments, and ordinances of the Lord, you will live. Same thing Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 18. This is always the promise of the covenant to mankind. You do his ways, 
that's what he judges you off of. And if he's, and if he sees that you're faithful to the end to practice his ways, you don't have to be perfect at it. That's why you got a priesthood in case you mess up, you make atonement for you. But if he sees you're practicing his ways and it specifically uses the word practice, not, not to perfectly do it, but to practice it, that's what he evaluates your life on and will give you eternal life um, at the end to per to forever do his ways with your new heart, new body that has his laws on it. So, this is in the same way. This is what Enoch is being explained to by the angels. Like you were meant for righteousness. You are the son of man who's meant for righteousness. Now, a lot of people like to reinterpret that because they think it's trying there. There's trying to show Enoch. He's the Messiah, but that's not what it's saying. Pre there's many more chapters before that where Enoch has already seen the son of man who goes with the ancient of days, the Lord of spirits, um, and has been given authority over all the nations and over all the angels. And that's the son of man, the Messiah. Enoch is even in the book of Enoch itself. It says that Enoch is the seventh from Adam. He's not some dude that pre-existed with the father who was given authority over all the angels. That's so people that make that claim, they haven't read the book. I, I like the book of Enoch. I've, I've read it a couple of times through. Um, yeah, I think it answers a lot of questions that aren't in the Bible. Yeah, it does. I, I, I wouldn't. I don't know if I'm willing to say that it's scripture, but it's it's a good read. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. There was a, a second century, quote unquote, early church father, and the, his name was Tertullian. He called it scripture. Yeah, I think I think um, the Coptic church and the Ethiopian like Egyptian churches, scripture. yeah, hold the Book of Enoch as they've they've as called canon. it canon for two thousand years. Yeah, isn't it made up of multiple books? Like, and there are three mm -hmm. Enochs that are pressed into it. Uh, it's from the six different scrolls. And some of the scrolls are from the book of Noah and the rest are from the book of Enoch. And so you just have to kind of research as far as the compilation that we have today is a collection of different scrolls that is called first Enoch. Now we do not give any weight to what is typically called second and third Enoch. We believe there's no chain of custody and there's a lot of contradictory theology in those books. And we, we do not believe those are scripture at all. Um, and I mean, second, second Enoch is, Pretty like if you actually know your your Bible when you read Second Enoch, you can easily see there's some huge problems there. But Third Enoch is blatantly Gnostic. I mean, Third Enoch claims some wild stuff um, and goes into full on like Kabbalah stuff. But First Enoch, if you actually know your Bible, and this I'm not trying to sound arrogant. I'm just lovingly putting this forward to anyone listening, because I have literally published an entire study guide on first Enoch comparing everything in first Enoch and showing you how all the theology matches the regular Bible that we still have today. If you know your Bible, you easily can read Enoch and go, Oh, that's Isaiah 42. Oh, that's Isaiah 49. Oh, that's, I see that, that that's amazing. That's like right here in Matthew 25. This is it. Oh, this is, this is the beginning of the garden from Genesis three. Like you can clearly understand uh, the themes that it represents, even though it's not, even though it's a collection of six different fragmented scrolls, the information that's still in it, it perfectly theologically lines up with the scriptures that we have. And, that, and that's it has a book. ton of prophecy. Yeah, this is my book that I. So, so you wrote that. Where, where can you get that at? Uh, it's on Amazon. It's in all the videos. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll link it to here. this this channel then. Yeah, and I color coded it so you can like see the different color tabs while you're reading the text and you know like what theme it's talking about. So like, um, you know, the light blue is called creation. And so this whole passage here is describing the creation model. Um, so yeah, there's the book of uh, first Enoch, literally it's opening verse says to you, this is a book written for a remote and distant generation undergoing tribulation. And then the following verses after that talk about when the great Holy one arrives and visits the earth and routes out the wicked. That's the day of the Lord. Right, the, the mean, Lord of Spirits. Yeah. So it just amazes me um, that you have a, an abundance of testimony from the writers of the Bible and from the people that lived in the, in the contemporaries of the writers of the Bible, the people that lived thousands of years ago. They've all said First Enoch is Scripture and that it was the rabbis who rejected Christ that created their own canon in the first century AD that decided to leave out the book of Enoch. Guess what? The book of Enoch emphatically tells you about Christ, his preexistence, and his second coming. You can't get around it. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. The book of Enoch book. is strong on on 
yeah. pre-existence. So if you got a group of self-imposed religious leaders like the Pharisees, the same group of Pharisees that betrayed Christ and killed him, of course they're going to want people not to read a book that prophesies Christ. <laughs> So yeah, there's a long history there. You just kind of kind of have to study it out. We've done a, quite a bit of work on it on my channel. That that's another thing that led me to pre-existence. I started reading Ignatius, and he quotes the Bi He's quoting the Bible a lot, like so many different verses from all these books. Either it was written way later, or he the Spirit of God moved on him, or he was around the apostles. What do you mean he's quoting what? Like Ignatius, one of the church fathers, is writing yeah. like in 100 AD, 110 AD, and he's quoting scripture. These books weren't even around yet in circulation. So either the book's way later than it claims or... What, what, what scripture though are you claiming he's quoting that wasn't around yet? Well, he, he references um, Bible verses like out of, out of different books. So... What I'm getting at, either it's a much later writing and they added those in, or he was actually around with the apostles. Well, I was just asking if you had an example of what you're saying. Like, I don't know any off the, the top of my That's head, okay. but okay. yeah, there, there's a bunch but of just keep, But he talks about pre existence a lot. So that that's what made me um really kind of open my eyes to pre existence and then I went back and looked at other things. Okay. So well, I think there is, I think there is a good case for the pre-existence of Christ to all those that don't believe in it. Yeah. You know, a lot of Trinitarians they love to use 1 Timothy 3:16 to talk about the mystery of godliness, how you need to depend on the translation, you'll say God was manifest in the flesh, but some of the texts say he was manifested in the flesh. Either way, they use that to say, "Oh, look, it's God manifested in the flesh," because remember like we talked about, they're not defining God. So they just generically use this term, God manifest in the flesh. But if you understand what the word God means, and it's a word applied to a ruler and to heavenly beings, then it makes perfect sense if Yeshua preexisted that he, as a formerly, before he became in the flesh, he's of an Elohim Theos status, which is the word for God in English. And then he become, he dethrones his glory, as Philippians 2, 6 and 7 says, and then is met, found in the appearance and likeness of a man, or as 1 Timothy 3.16 says, he is manifested in the flesh. This is what uh, this is what I've tried to propose to uh, Trinitarians, that the passage is not saying God the Father came in the flesh, or that the essence of three persons in one being broke its part of itself off and came in the flesh. No, that's a philosophical idea. That's not a scriptural exegesis. What I would say is that the word God theos in the greek is a heavenly being who's a ruler in a ruler capacity and that's the one who dethroned who derobed who manifested in the flesh through the womb of mary as the holy spirit impregnated her and that is what paul's trying to explain as the mystery of godliness is how someone that used to be a spiritual nature being can take off that nature that ontology but keep his essence but keep his soul if you will I mean, keep keep who he is, his identity, and then be manifested in the flesh of a woman, then die, then receive the promise of the resurrection, which is to be made a spiritual being. This is what Yeshua tells us, Luke 20, 36, that the resurrection will be made like the angels. Like Colossians says, that we'll be made like he is at his coming. So this is the whole point of our resurrected body, 1 Corinthians 15, Yeshua is the first fruits of the first resurrection to be made, go from the earthy to the spiritual. And that's what we're all destined to be, is to be made into a spiritual glorified being at the resurrection, if you make the resurrection of the righteous. And this is what Yeshua took part in. And so therefore he goes from this whole process, this mystery of godliness is like, Paul doesn't quite understand how this works. You go from a glorified Elohim status, a Theos status in heaven, you dethrone from that that type of physical nature you become a man that's just a man while you're in the flesh there's no hypostatic union <laughs> that's another catholic idea that's imposed onto the text but while you're in the flesh this is why he could face temptation and why he needed to overcome through obedience as hebrews 5 says and then once he dies and resurrects he now has an eternal body again and it's glorified man now and then he's placed in higher authority than even the angels. 
So this is a very unique concept as Paul tries to, like in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, he reminds the Corinthians, you know, do you not know that you will judge angels? Well, there's a reason that he says that. It's, it's, it's not just because arbitrarily the Father decides, I'm going to make mankind be able to judge angels. No, it's because at the resurrection of the righteous, your physical spiritual body is greater in capacity and obedience than even the angels. This is what it talks about. You'll never be able to sin again once you get your glorified resurrected body. So the angels can the, the angels don't die unless they're thrown in the lake of fire. So the ones that aren't thrown in the lake of fire, they live forever. But we know from Genesis 6, Jubilees 5, Enoch 6 through 15, 2 Peter 2, 4, Jude 1. We know that the angels can sin. I mean, every instance of Azazel, who's also called Satan throughout the scriptures, is a rebellious angel that's sinning. So we know that the angels can sin even though they have a glorified immortal body. But the promise to mankind at the resurrection is that our glorified immortal body gets God's laws emblazed on our heart to the point where we'll never sin. That's going to put us in a position of behavior that's better than even the angels. That's how we have the legal authority, according to the Torah, to judge the angels. Something to I, consider. I always took the verse, the judging angels was in line with Enoch, the ones that left their habitat habitation and then God put them in chains to the to the yeah. day of, of of judgment. Yeah, but the position of judgment in the Torah doesn't always mean that you're judging someone to condemnation. It also means that you are um, adjudicating the law in a position of authority over them. So this is why, like in Exodus 18, Moses chose uh, elders from the tribes so that they could help uh, adjudicate the law alongside him and settle disputes. And these are men who had to have a heart for the Torah, uh, have a heart for right behavior for God's law and be trusted with that position of judgment. But that doesn't mean that they're always judging people to condemnation. It was just a, uh, so yeah, that there's, there's a lot to it as when it comes to, this is also why we're promised uh, to, to take part in like first, uh, second Peter two, nine says we're take part in the divine nature and that will be made in the priestly order of the Melchizedek with Yeshua under his authority, like revelation 20 verse four through six also talks about. So that's a, that's a, um, a position that's higher than the angels and therefore we'll have judgment over them because we'll have a nature that's perfected and impossible to sin. Um, and, and the angels don't even have that. So it's a, this is why mankind is a unique creation. This is why the, the devil and the unclean spirits hate mankind so much because we're literally de The whole storyline is that we're destined to be in a position of authority and rulership over over the angels, uh, right alongside the Son of God, but underneath his authority, obviously. Right. Yeah. What, what would you say, what, was Jesus created of the same, I guess, substance as the Father from the beginning? I guess, like... Well, this is where you go into, you're arguing, I don't think you're intentionally trying to argue, but you're repeating Catholic, or you're repeating... Um, yeah, like Trinitarians would say, yeah. Philosophical all... Trinitarian concept that the Godhead, the authority structure of the Father, Son, and the Spirit that they use throughout creation to, to minister, you're you're assuming that that's a special type of ontology that's different than the angels. But the Bible doesn't tell us that. That's a Catholic Trinitarian imposition into the text. There's no third ontology listed in Scripture. John 4 tells us that Yahweh, God, the Almighty, is Spirit. Tells us that the angels are spirit; they're made of spiritual beings. So, would you would you say Jesus was an angel before he's not coming? An angel, he's not. He's not an, an angel. Just means the word messenger, right? So, if we're talking about the different classes of heavenly beings that are described in the scriptures, you've got things like the watchers, the seraphim, the cherubim, and the ophanim. Those are the four dominant classes that are at least told to us in the majority of of Christian texts, or, or all Hebrew and Christian texts is those four classes of angel of heavenly beings. And all of those can be referred to as an angel if they're sent on a mission to the earth. So Yeshua is the son of the Almighty. None of the angels are said like that. So he's in a very different position. But what are those beings in heaven made of? Are they made of the dirt of the earth like we are? No, they're made of water and spirit. This is what's this is why we're promised to be made of water and spirit at the resurrection. Where'd you get water from? Just asking. Um, 
It's it's uh, John chapter three. Um, it's uh, second Baruch. Um, it's it's the concept of um, what the angels themselves are described as. Um, me and some buddies have done entire videos on it. We've done shows on it where we talk about what angels are made of. And go through all the scriptures. Unfortunately, I don't have the all the scriptures at the top of my head right now. But do you remember? Yeah, you're fine. I, I was just curious. Yeah, do you remember in the book of uh, John where he says, um, "If you'd asked me in John chapter four, he goes, but I promise you, if you ask me for for water, I give you water that you may, you'll never thirst again. That living water flowing up from within you. Yeah, because you're at the resurrection. You, that's the judge talking, right? Right, the guy that's going to choose to whether or not to raise you to eternal life. And if you and if he gives you resurrection to eternal life, he gives you a new body made of water and spirit. Like we're made of. Remember Genesis two seven. The dirt of the earth, God breathed his spirit into it, and we became a living soul. So we're made of dirt and spirit. The spirit of God animates us. And when, when our fleshly body dies, that spirit that animated us goes back to the one who gave it, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. But at the resurrection, you get a body made of water, which is different. It doesn't decay. And it's animated by the spirit, just like all things in all of creation are as well. So it's... Um, it's a beautiful promise um, ministering like, um, and this is also when you start studying the properties of water, water is kind of a, a unique topic for scientists. It's kind of like a, um, it's a, it's a mystery to them, like how water works and all the different things it can do. Uh, because it literally is, you know, like, like Peter talks about the earth itself was created in water and out of, and was brought out of water. Um, the word heaven itself means a covering of water in Hebrew. Um, and that's what is described in Genesis one, how there's a layer of water above the firmament above us. Um, Psalm 148 talks about the waters in heaven and they praise the Lord as well. Um, the ministering flames of flame and fire and wind are also, uh, an attribute of how water can change properties and it can be ignited into fire with certain frequencies, or it can be become a wisp of, of whistling wind when it's dissipated. Um, it's it, water has an amazing con it's just an amazing feature and, and no one knows like how you actually, you can't destroy it, right? You burn water, you evaporate it. It goes into a different form, becomes gaseous, collects and condenses and becomes solid again, or becomes liquid again. You can't destroy water. Right. What don't the demons hate water though? If they were ma made of water, well, the I, I don't demons are a unique concept because uh, according to you know, oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's right because they're the disembodied. Yep, yeah, okay, yep. Well, but still that that disembodied part, um, they're called spiritual beings. They're not called uh, men of the earth. Like they're right, they're earth, spirits. They're, they're, they're Nephilim, that the, earth. the Nephilim, and that's why the term in Hebrew means the fallen ones, uh, because they're they're perpetually unclean. They're perpetually, they're not, there's their, their um, makeup, if you will, as being described by the, the Hebrew literature is one that it's perpetually destroyed, uh, unclean. They're called the Shadim in the Hebrew in, in Deuteronomy, but um, which means the shades. And uh, this is why many people, when they say they see demons, see black shadowy figures. But yet when they claim they see an angel, they see something like a being of light. It was a very different concept there. Um, the demons are a different type of thing. And I, whether they like water or not, I mean, I, it says they go, you know, when Shua says they're kicked out of a man, they go through dry and arid places and then come back seeking a host. Uh, so it's, I don't know if that does it mean they like, don't like water. I don't know if it really affects them like that because they can move through substances kind of like the wind can. You know what I'm saying? They can move through a room or a wall or the ground. And so they're coming in contact with water at all times. I mean, your body's seventy percent water. So, like, if they inhabit someone to possess them, they're around water all the time. So, who who's more cringe to you, Trinitarians or oneness? <laughs> Any Christian that puts himself in the position of Christ to judge another man's soul based off of, you know, an arbitrary statement of faith, um, especially when it's not actually found in scripture and they're just making it up that's cringe those are people i i have less and less respect for throughout the years if you can't just explain your beliefs from scripture that from scripture not not this idea that trinitarians say where they go well collectively 
it's in there. Yeah, the word Trinity may not be spoken in the Bible, but when you put it all together, it's in there. And I'm like, all right, show me the process of how you're putting it all together. Because all I've seen is you start inserting information and making up terms to, quote unquote, put it all together and claim your doctrine. And then once you've, quote unquote, put it all together, according to your own personal interpretation, then if I don't believe your horribly confusing and contradictory wording that doesn't match the definitions of the words, you tell me I'm going to hell. That's cringe. That's not respectable. So that's that's a point where I I try to show patience, but sometimes I, I lose my patience with those those men because they put themselves in the judgment seat of Christ. And to me, that is just like super disrespectful to Christ. Yeah, who are you to judge another man's servant, as Paul explains to us in Romans? Like, just if you think that guy is off on his theology, pray for him, share your share your opinions with him, and let it go. You are not in the seat of Christ to, de to determine who's getting salvation and who's not. Um, man, I just had a good question for you. Oh, what what did you grow up? Did you grow up in religion? Like in my father, yeah, my father was a pastor, um, and it was kind of like a non denominational. But I think he graduated from a like he used to pastor a church that was non denominational. But I think he graduated from a seminary that was an assembly of God denomination, and so. I grew up in a church that was like, you know, they allowed free flow of the gifts of the spirit. Um, people sometimes would dance in the aisles, you know, and they got excited, praising God. Uh, they'd raise their hands. Sometimes they'd fall out in the spirit. Uh, they would speak in tongues. They would have interpretations from across the room of what supposedly was said in tongues. And, you know, I don't know if it was right or not. You just got to trust it. But um, it, that was that type of atmosphere. And then right, P Pentecostal apostolic. Yeah. But then when I was like 16, I started uh, attending a Baptist, a Southern Baptist church. And that was very different because my, my father stopped uh, pastoring. He then went off into do what he still does today, which he has orphanages in different countries. He runs a, an international uh, ministry that deals with different orphanages. And, um, oh, and cool. so he'd stop pastoring a church and I always started going to different types of churches. And I went to a Southern Baptist church for a while. That was different Then I went to a Methodist church. that was different. I went to um, other types of word of faith or slash Pentecostal style churches. And I even went to a Presbyterian church for a year. And uh, that was very different. But what I noticed throughout all those churches is that I was the weird one because I was the guy actually trying to make friends in the church and ask people about the Bible. So like I was reading the Bible and I have been since 1997 trying to learn it. Not, not not trying to to know certain verses just so I can quote them at people, but so I could like literally learn it. It's like from like if there's a book Genesis, I want to know what the whole book is about, who the main characters are, what the setting is, what the denouement of the book is. Because I'm, I'm I jokingly call myself a word nerd. It's one of those deals where I say like, I want to know the book inside and out. I want to know why this book was written, what it's trying to communicate. And when I started trying to treat the Bible like that, seriously read it and understand it, not just to be familiar with like, oh, yeah, I know that the Gospels are in the in the latter part of the book and like the book of first and second Kings is in the middle. Like, no, no, I wanted to know what's going on in the book of of Haggai. Let's go. Who's Haggai? Oh, I found out later through study. He's a contemporary of Daniel. He was in the Babylonian exile along with Daniel. And I'm like, oh, that seems to be important to know. <laughs> Daniel had a prophet buddy contemporary. You know what I mean? That's kind of like a, an encouraging thing. Daniel wasn't alone. You know what I mean? So just stuff like that, man. Then I then I started really digging into studying the Bible and going to church and trying to ask people like, hey, man, what do you think about this passage here? You know, They like, get offended when you ask questions. Oh, don't they? bro, they had no clue because nobody's reading their Bible. They mm -hmm. were going, like the majority, like 90% of the people that I ran into at church were they're going to church because of the social aspect. You know, they all think we're Christians. I can feel comfortable here and we can have the potluck after church and then we can chill and we can, or maybe we'll go to Applebee's or something like after the service and they can all hang out and chat and everything. But nobody's chatting about the Bible. Nobody actually wants to know it. Well, I got to piss. This is funny. Someone asked if you're circumcised. Your wife said, Hey, Pecker Checkers, Sean is circumcised. Sincerely, his wife. That made me laugh. I had to put that comment up there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's so I, funny. I Every in... time you start talking about uh, the law of God, people immediately just start being like, they just start trying to find the the most weirdest accusations against right. you. Right. Um, just to try to demonize you or try to denigrate you. It's, sure, it's truly bad fruit. It really is some bad fruit. 
I, I, I had that problem when I was in church. I'd ask questions and like the pastors would get mad. Yeah. They get mad, seen, especially, when it, goes against, especially when it I, goes against the, the doctrinal belief or the core doctrine. You ask yeah. a question against that, they get mad. Richard, have you watched any of my interviews with pastors, professors, or people? No, I'll be honest. I've, I've only seen the one um, debate you did, which with, was like oh, a casual yeah. debate with two biblical Unitarians on the preexistence. Okay, I got you. But honestly, I just found your I just found your channel like last week, and I emailed you. Okay. Afterwards. Well, good news, brother. I know that you've had some some gentlemen on. I, I watched a couple of your videos, and uh, I'm, I want to encourage you to continue doing what you're doing. Um, you've clearly got some. Uh, I'm I'm happy to hear that these guys are willing to respond to you. Like I, I reach out to, to pastors, professors, and PhDs, and they don't respond to me, or they directly tell me, um, "I looked at your channel, and you're not orthodox, and so I don't want to come on and talk to you." And I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> so like, uh, keep going, bro. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, and, people get uh, mad. Like people are mad. Like I have you on right. I don't agree with everything you've said today, but I can be respectful sure. to you. You know what I mean? You, you're not sure. you're not well, hurting my faith by. No one hurts right. my faith because they believe differently or have a different right. opinion. I can still be casual or we can still be normal and I can have a conversation with people and people That's get right. mad over that. I, yeah. Anything I've said today that may have raised your eyebrow or you don't quite, quite understand why I'm saying it sounds weird. I would just say research it, bro. Just check it out. Right. I, I didn't come to these, these statements lightly. This is after 20 plus years of reading and studying the Bible diligently. Um, doing lots of research and um and i have all these videos that you're gonna end up watching hopefully that you see where i exegete these ideas to phds and profess professors and pastors and they don't have an answer for them they just say i don't know or they try to reinterpret or they get mad and start knee jerking uh, and just continue to try to call me a mormon even though i've denounced mormonism over and over again they just start trolling so like that you start seeing some really bad fruit come out when you start challenging mainstream traditional positions that are not in scripture. And then when I start trying to define basic words, like what's a priest do? So if I asked you right now, just man to man, like what's a priest do? What, what would you say the priest does? I don't know. They're that they're the people that walk around the Catholic church with that smoke thing. No, uh, the biblical priests, <laughs> like yeah. in the Old Testament, like you know, they offer they offered this the sacrifices b before Israel unto God. Okay, cool. And they were the ones oh. that entered. The, they were the only ones that could enter the the holy of holies. Right. And they had to tie a rope around them and be drug out if the if they were a sinner and they went in there. So when the, the when the Old Testament prophecies and the New Testament says that Jesus is a priest, what do you think he's doing? Well, I I would always I always took that as because he gave the the final sacrifice, which would That's be the a cross. Priest a priest doesn't kill himself on a cross. So what's so Jesus was made a priest after he went to the cross, after he was resurrected and ascended to heaven. That's when he was given his priesthood. So what's a priest do? Someone that offers a, a sacrifice. Is it that easy? But he he did offer a sacrifice. He gave himself. Yahweh doesn't accept human flesh or human blood on his altar. And Christ was crucified on a cross by Romans, betrayed by his own people, um, falsely accused and killed. He was murdered. What we would consider martyrdom, persecuted for being a righteous man. That's not the instruction for a priest who presents a meal before Yahweh on an altar in a temple. So Christ was given his priesthood position after he went to the cross after he was resurrected and ascended to heaven. So I would just say, if we have consistency and continuity in the scriptures, and the scriptures already clearly defined for us that a priest ministers a meal created on an altar to God, then that's what Yeshua is doing. That's what creates peace. This is why 1 Timothy 2.5 says that he's mediating between God and man. Uh, Hebrews 9 verse 27 says he ever lives to intercede for us. This is the job of a priest. Yeah, you and I. Hey, think about I, this. I, I'll be honest. I, I've, I've never heard this view ever, so I've I've never read it. I've never looked into it. So, you want me to pull up um, the scripture for you, real quick. Yeah, you you can pull up whatever you'd like. If you send a thing, I'll I'll, I'll put it on. Okay. Sure, I'll pull something up real quick, and then you. I'm yeah, gonna I'm gonna be honest. I've never heard this view ever in in my life. 
I know it, a lot of pastors glaze right over this stuff too, but it's always been there. It's in the Bible, right? I mean, this is the same Bible we all read. And I'm going to be honest right now. I'm rejecting it wholeheartedly, but I know. So look with this verse one. This is the point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, who ministers. That's a present tense active word who ministers in the sanctuary and true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. And since every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. Then it goes on to say in verse 4, just to distinguish between the two different classes of priests, that he's not a Levite priest. It says if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are already those who offer gifts according to the law. So this is after the cross. The Levites were still ministering in the temple before the Romans destroyed the temple. So the, the earthly priesthood amongst mankind has been given to the Levites forever, but the priesthood of heaven and the temple in heaven was given to Yeshua. And in the future, I just want to encourage you, in the future, you and I are going to be made priests with Yeshua. Yeah, have you read that passage? Um, I'm trying, I'm drawing a blank. What, what book is you. that out of? Yeah, I'll pull it up for you, brother. It's a pretty, pretty in our face. It's like right here and just people skip over it, right? Because uh, they have a different um, interpretation that, that kind of blinds them to some of the verses. But uh, here in Revelation 20, if you put, um, I don't know if you put that on screen yet, but oh, there it goes. So in verse four in Revelation 20, it says, Then I saw the thrones and those seated on them had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And for those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, the rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years were complete. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. How do you take the, the thousand year? Well, before we go into all that, just real quick. Right. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to change the subject on you. What do you think about this? I mean, this says that you and I at the resurre the first resurrection event, you and I are going to be called priests with, with God and under the authority of Christ. So a priest is someone who ministers in a temple. Now, in the ancient Israel, a priest had several different jobs. He didn't always just all day sit there and prepare an animal to be put on an altar and cooked and presented to Yahweh. He also knew the law of God and taught it to others. And he also did maintenance for the house of God itself, the temple itself. So, but either way, all capacity, like the, the priest is someone who's ordained to be a minister, to be able to prepare and present a food offering to Yahweh. And this is what was prophesied, that Yeshua himself would be a priest of God. But it's interesting because Christ, Christ's body is the temple, and then at the same time, it's a sacrifice, and he's the high priest. And then even Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. So we're all a sacrifice unto God, even right now. In Revelation 3, Yeshua says that he will make you and I, if we overcome, he'll make us a pillar in the house and the temple of his God. So if we take these descriptions that you just mentioned and the description that Jesus mentioned about us, if we take them literally, then Jesus is a temple and you're a sacrifice and Jesus is a sacrifice and I'm a pillar, but somehow I'm simultaneously at, at both a temple and a sacrifice and a pillar in that temple. Jesus also called himself the bread of life. Is he literally a loaf of bread? No, he tells oh, you what, oh. what what it is. It's The bread is his right. body. Yeah, so in the same way the New Testament writers, they spoke in metaphor to explain the attributes of your discipleship with Christ and the attributes, and they related it back to things that they were all commonly aware of, which was the temple process. That was an intricate part of their culture and their life. Remember, they, they would come to the temple and the synagogues often, I mean, we see in Acts 21, the disciples ask Paul to take these four Greek guys and go to the temple and do a vow offering. It was like a common way of life. 
three times, like Acts 18, Acts 20, uh, Paul is rushing back from his missionary journeys to celebrate Shavuot, which is uh, required to come to the temple on that day of first fruits. So they take all these descriptions of the temple of the Old Testament, and they apply them in a metaphoric fashion to our, our life, right? That's why we're living sacrifices. Our obedience is analogous to being a living sacrifice. But you're, you're literally not an animal that's chopped up and cooked on an altar before Yahweh by a priest. Right. Right. We understand these are, these are metaphors that describe the discipleship process that we're encouraged to undergo as disciples of Christ. And the Hebrew people of the first century were writing about those metaphors, relating it to things that they were all aware of, which was this active process of temple worship. Remember, I defined the two types of worship at the beginning of this conversation. So they all understood what temple worship was. That was an active, common way of life. So they would take analogies or metaphors from that process and apply them to an encouragement towards discipleship. To saying, do you not know that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? Where there was a literal temple of the Holy Spirit in the backdrop in their community in Jerusalem, the temple of God. But then metaphorically, Paul's trying to encourage you, hey, don't go have sex with a prostitute. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit, man. Like, you know, take take incredible respect for yourself that you're that the spirit of the living God is willing to dwell inside you through the deposit of faith. So treat yourself as if you're the actual temple of God. Like an, you would never bring a prostitute in the temple right. of God. So don't, you know what I'm saying? So like that's that's the uh that's the the thing is about defining the the metaphors versus the actual process. And the actual process is that Yeshua, who's called the light of life, the truth, the way, um, he's also called the, the the bread of heaven, the manna that came down from heaven. He's called the good shepherd. But right, he never the door, the branch, the lamb. Sheep. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's given all these descriptive phrases, but his literal job function was prophesied of him and affirmed by the New Testament writers. Even, even the early church fathers, they talked about him. He is the high priest and guardian of your soul in heavens above. Like, so he's he's doing an active job as high priest to minister atonement for you. So you know that passage in 1 John 1, 9, where it says that if you sin, you confess your sins, and he's faithful and just to cleanse you of all unrighteousness? Yep. Yeah, so that's a process that's outlined in the Old Testament for a priest. So you would confess your sins to God, but you're confessing through the vehicle of a priest. Right, the priest. mediator. Right. And then that 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 priest, that mediator, receives your confession of sins and then goes and according to what type of sin it is, that goes and creates a propitiation offering for you to the Father. So in the same way, we confess our sins to God. Christ hears those, does his job as the mediator between us and makes the Father happy to atone for our sins. Yeah. Is this something to study? I know I know that you're yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, getting a lot I, I from watch a couple right. videos on it. I'll be honest, I've I've never heard of this. I'm rejecting it flat out right now, but sure. I, well, I would I, say I, I will look into you, it though. In the future, though, as you because you I know you've had lots of different people on your channel to talk about different concepts, but the the thing I would just encourage people listening to be careful of is if you reject something, make sure you're rejecting it because the scripture is rejected. But if the scriptures blatantly tell you something is happening, at least put it at the very minimum, I'd say put it on the back burner to research it more before outright rejecting it. But that's just my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so many of us reject things just because it doesn't fit in our dogma or our group or, or whatever we flat out the night. But um, I appreciate you coming on, Sean, even though I don't agree with everything. This was a cool conversation. I respect yeah, you. Right. and um, Yeah. I appreciate you. Yeah, bro. I always tell people the sower sows the word. And I'm gonna I'm gonna link your um channel and your Enoch book to this video. Hey man, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. All right, man. Yeah, appreciate you. Cool. Take it easy. Yep. See ya.